everyone, my name is Marlo. Welcome to a video teaching going along with the Names of God Bible Study. You are absolutely free to come join along this study by going to the website injesusname.net and subscribe and you'll get three teachings sent to you a week on a separate name of God along with some questions and one of those teachings will be video form like this one. So please feel free to join. It is absolutely free. Today's video teaching is going along with a Bible verse that we actually started to study last time. It's a Bible verse found in Isaiah that actually has a bunch of names of God in it, and one of them we did last time, which was P Prince of Peace. But I want to go back to it to find another name of God worth studying. And so let's go to Isaiah 9-6, and we're going to read the verse again, a very familiar verse to most people. Um, and let's just pick out the next name of God. For, uh, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So for today's Bible study, I want to focus in on the name Mighty God. It's a, it's a mighty name, and so it's worth taking a look at. And what's interesting about that name, mighty, um, is it's, you know, it's definition. And let's just, I went to the Bible, to the uh, di dictionary to find out the definition. Let's, let's read it so you can hear what does mighty mean. Possessing great and impressive power or strength, especially on account of size. Some synonyms are fearsome, ferocious, big, tough, robust, potent, dominant, influential, important, leading, authoritarian, and powerful. So all of those names are names associated with our God. And what's interesting to me about it is in that verse, that Isaiah verse, you see that those names are talking about this son that has been given, that son being Jesus. And so those names are not names that most people want to put together with Jesus. They want to put together with Jesus humble and meek and mild and loving and forgiving, but not, you know, potent and fearsome and ferocious. But clearly from the Isaiah verse, those names, those synonyms go along with our Jesus. And so we have found, you know, through this study that Jesus is God. And so you cannot separate um, God from Jesus as far as God the Father and Jesus or God of the Old Testament and Jesus, one and the same. And so that's even more proven by the fact that this verse, this, this verse that I just read is from the Old Testament. It's an Old Testament verse that we all know because of the Christmas story, but it's, it's from the Old Testament that this son, this baby is mighty and robust and potent and dominant and influential. And so we got to wrap our minds around that is the nature of Jesus. And so um, for today, I want to go into the Old Testament and share with you another verse which talks about God being mighty. And then we'll discuss more about this, this idea of a mighty God, a potent, powerful, influential, influential God. So let's go to the book of Jeremiah, and we're going to read in Jeremiah 32, 17 through 19, a little more about God being mighty. Now, I just want to say to, to some of you who have been studying along with me, sometimes the videos and the Bible teachings don't have a lot of verses, and some they do. This is one of those teachings where there's going to be a lot of Bible verses, so you might want to get a pen and jot them down, because I try to speak quickly because I know people don't like to watch long, long videos, so just get ready because there's going to be Bible verses. And here we go. Jeremiah 32, 17 through 19, speaking about mighty God. Now, I want to set up the scene of this just a little bit so you know where we're, where we're at as far as, as far as Israel's history when this was spoken into. So Jeremiah is a prophet to Israel. And he's a prophet at a time where the nation of Israel, the, particularly the southern part, is under siege by Babylon. And so Jeremiah is writing this, it's a prayer, and he's just starting it off by, by saying these words. And um, it's all under that context of, of his beloved nation being under attack by Babylon, which is the byproduct of the nation of Israel disobeying God's commands. And what, what God has done very clearly to the, to the nation of Israel is he's pulled them out of 
Egypt out of slavery. He saved them, delivered them to a promised land, and then he gave them a bunch of rules to live by which would keep them safe and under his wing. And in Deuteronomy 28, we see that God says, if you listen to these these rules, these, these commands, you'll be blessed. But if you don't, you'll be cursed. And one of the curses, unfortunately, is that they would be kicked out of this promised land. So this is now hundreds of years later after that original promise of God and Israel's agreeing to keep that their promise to God to follow him. And, and God is allowing this to come to Israel because they have not followed him. So Babylon is coming to conquer and here the prophet Jeremiah is pleading out to God. He's confused and he wants he wants to just have a, a talk with God. So Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. So here we have, interestingly, in that, in that verse, you have the name Mighty God again, but you also see that Jeremiah talks about um, God being uh, great in counsel. So we saw that in the Isaiah verse too. We saw a wonderful counselor, Mighty God. So here Jeremiah is putting two together also, that God is, is great in his counsel, great in his advice, and he's also mighty. And you also see Jeremiah saying that, God's eyes are open to the ways of man. He sees everything and he rewards them according to their deeds. So God has great advice. God can see everything that we're doing. He's mighty and he can reward those who do, who do good deeds, who follow him. So what I want to talk to you about today is this concept here that we see outlaid that that there's blessings from following God and curses from not following God and how that has kind of derailed a lot of us in the way that we look at God even to today. But it's not really a whole lot of people's fault because you can see right here that Jeremiah is even saying that God will reward people according to their deeds. And so where it derails people is many people carry this idea over to the fact that if they do good work on earth, they will be rewarded with heaven. And that is not at all what our Bibles say. In fact, our Bibles say that there's nothing that we can do on earth that can gain us entrance to heaven. Our entrance to heaven is by grace alone, by faith in Jesus. Now we can see that in the New Testament, if you like. Let's turn to Ephesians. And we'll just read it so you don't have to just trust my word on it. But um, our entrance to heaven has nothing to do with our works. And this is in Ephesians 2. I'll just read 4 through 9. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, tres, trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace... <clears throat> sorry... Got to flip a page. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast." So clear as a bell there that our entrance to heaven has nothing to do with our work on earth. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross. But what are we to do then with this idea that is very clearly laid out here that our works do get us blessing? Well, it's very true that our work on earth specifically our following God on earth, get us blessing. And the way that that happens is that we're protected from 
doing things that are outside of the protection of God's wings or out of his will. And so when we follow God, we stay within his will. And with that, we become blessed because we're not doing things which cause us consequence. And so that is where the blessing of God comes from. And that's where the reward of God comes from that Jeremiah is speaking of here. And I'll read it again. <clears throat> O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. And so the blessings, the rewards on earth come to those who follow God. The fruit of their deeds are, is rewarded. No consequences come to you if you are if you're serving God. Now that does not mean that bad things don't come on earth if you're serving God because bad things do come. But blessings also come from serving God and those blessings don't necessarily look like riches and fame. They look like joy and peace and a, um, a settledness and a contentment and a um, just a a feeling of giving love to others and all of that is blessing and and it is a reward of God for just working within his will and it's something that has been set up like I said way back from the Old Testament that if you follow God blessings do come and if you don't curses do come and so this is something that is valid and it is true but where it isn't true as I said is in your getting to heaven and that is a, a major differentiation that I want you to, to be sure that you know that your work on earth has nothing to do with your being rewarded with heaven. Works don't get you into heaven. But <laughs> I will say that this idea of rewards does have some place in heaven. And so as you read the, Old, the New Testament, you are going to see that those who believe in God and make it into heaven will be rewarded in heaven for their good deeds. And this is where it gets to be mind-blowing. It's like, Marla, you just said my works on earth are not going to be rewarded on earth, you know, with heaven. That is true. But those works are seen by God. And the believer who does good work for God will be rewarded for that work in heaven. And how they are rewarded is with crowns. So let's review, all right? Person is following God on earth and they're blessed on earth for following him with joy and peace and abundance of friends, maybe wealth, maybe not, maybe fame, maybe not, but there are rewards for following God in that the consequences of not following God don't come to your life. The consequences that the nation of Israel were, were getting for not following God were being kicked out of their, their land. They just were not able to have the peace that, that God promised them in the promised land because they weren't following him. So this kind of stuff happens on earth for people who are not following God. Now, for, for those people who trust Jesus for their salvation, they will be rewarded with heaven, not based on what they've done on earth, but they will get to heaven where Jesus, who is mighty God, has seen all of their works on earth and they will be rewarded there, once they're already there, for what they've done. And their reward comes at something called the Bema Seat. This word bima is a greek word and it's used to encapsulate the the concept judgment seat so when you hear the words bima seat you are it's okay to think judgment seat of christ but i don't want you to think as a believer you are going to be judged by jesus for your sin because the bible is very clear that if you have put your faith and trust in jesus all of your sin has been forgiven, never to be looked at again or judged again by God. Now, you can see this, and um, I want you to make sure you have some verses to see this, and I won't read them, but go to Hebrews 8, 12, 
1 John 1 7 there's lots of places even in the Old Testament where this is talked about of uh, Psalm 103 10 through 12 Isaiah 44 22 and others that is clear that if you have been saved by God wiped clean of your sin of your iniquity he will never ever judge them again in heaven if you have believed in Jesus you go to heaven and you're sin free wiped away clean so you are not being judged of your sin at this bema seat this judgment seat of Christ you're being judged for how faithful you were with what God gave you on earth how you stewarded all of his blessings that he gave to you and so the believer in Jesus will be judged on what they did on earth and they will be given crowns for what they did on earth at this Bema seat of Christ. Now, I want to tell you that the heart of a believer is never to do great things for God on earth for these crowns. We don't work on earth to get crowns. We do what we do for Jesus out of love for Jesus. It's, it's just we love him because he saved us when we were dead in our sin. And so we want to give back to the kingdom of God. So our, our, our motivation is not for a crown, but God, mighty God in his mercy, who could have crushed us at any moment for dropping the ball with the blessings that he's given us, instead says, I'm going to reward you for what you've done for me. As if heaven wasn't enough, he's going to just lump crowns on us in heaven those of us who believe for what we did for the kingdom of God. So I want you to, um, first of all, have some verses that talk about the Bema seat so you can read them. So in 1 Corinthians 4, um, 2, if you turn there, you're going to see some of the language about, about God looking for those who have been found faithful on this earth and and recognizing it so in 1st Corinthians 4 2 it reads moreover it is required of stewards that they be found faithful so God is talking about us as his servants being good stewards of what he has given to us and it's required of us to be found faithful so God says I'm giving you blessings what are you going to do with them? It's required of you to do good with the good, the blessings that have come your way from following me. Then in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, these are the verses that, that talk about this Bema seat. So in 1 Corinthians 3, sorry, 10 through 15, it says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. This is Paul talking. Let each one take care on how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work, work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will, will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So what Paul is saying here is that he himself, he's saying, I, I've, I've laid a seed. I've, I've shared the gospel with people. If you come along and you add to that, that is kingdom work. That type of work is what Jesus sees and will reward at the Bema seat. That's eternal work. So you see that Paul lays out that there are six different types of, of things that are going to be looked at. At, that are laid up on top of the foundation, the gospel um, work. Things like gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. And you can see that three of those things will not be burned up by fire, and three of those things will. The gold, the silver, the precious stones, that won't get burned up. The wood, the hay, the stubble, that will get burned up. And so what Paul is trying to say here is that work that is earthly, the wood, the hay, the stubble, all that stuff, if, you, if you've done some work 
on this earth and it was for your glory, for your gain, that stuff Jesus is going to look at as you as a believer and say, that doesn't, that doesn't count. That doesn't get you a reward. But the stuff that's precious, the gold, the silver, precious stones, that doesn't get built up. That's kingdom work. That stuff stands eternal. And that's the stuff that Jesus is going to reward at the Bema seat. Things, things like sharing the gospel with a neighbor, things like serving the poor in Jesus' name, going on a mission trip, that's all stuff that will not be burned up, that Jesus will look at and be faithful to a reward. As mighty God, he's going to come and give more blessings to us in, in heaven even as believers. So let's look at what the crowns are that a child of God can expect in heaven. Now, remembering that these crowns are not crowns of salvation. They're crowns of service. They are all based on what you've done for the Lord on earth. They didn't save you, but because you were saved and you decided to serve, God watched everything you did and crowns are coming your way. So the first crown is called the incorruptible crown, and it is a crown that's given to you as a believer for your faithfulness and self-control. The verse that you can go to to take a look at this is 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27. <clears throat> Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to, to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I, should, I myself should be disqualified. So you see, the, there is a wreath, an imperishable wreath. That's the crown that I'm talking about. That's given for... Um, faithfulness and self-control. Now, I want to say that that idea of the Bema seat, the judgment seat, it all comes from, in the Roman times, justices or judges of athletic competitions, they would be up on a platform. It was called the judgment seat, the Bema seat. And they would be looking at everything and make their judgment from it. So you can see here in this 1 Corinthians verse that Roman, uh, that Paul is talking to people in that athletic language, that if you exercise self-control, you will get this incorruptible wreath, which was a crown, the, the crown was a wreath, on your head, you'll get that in heaven, all right? So the second crown is called the crown of rejoicing, and you can see this, sorry about the dogs, in First Thessalonians uh, 2, 9. And let me see if I can turn there for you, and read. First Thessalonians uh, 2, I'm sorry, it's 2, 19. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. So you can see this crown of rejoicing is coming over those people that God has put in your path that you've served, your brothers, your sisters, your fellow Christians. It's a crown of rejoicing that we get for being in community with our brothers and sisters. There's another verse that you can look at for this. It's in um, Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my crown, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So, we as believers get a crown for the rejoicing we have over being in community with other believers, the other people that God has put in our place that we love in our in our lives that we love and we serve and we do life with. That is a crown that's given to us by God. Our friends, our family in the Lord is a crown given to us in heaven. So to me, that also means that I know I'm going to be with these people. In heaven, he, he, you know, we are just going to be together, crowns on each other's head, um, because we supported each other in this life on earth. Next crown, third crown, is the crown of righteousness. It's uh, a crown that's given for your faithfulness and your testimony. This can be found in 2 Timothy 
four through, uh, four, seven through eight. I'm so sorry about the dog. <laughs> I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so, Paul is saying there's a crown of righteousness coming for staying faithful to the testimony of Christ, for longing for his appearing. Are you looking up? Are you longing for the day that Jesus comes? Or are you stuck, worried about the things of this world? Because God says there's a crown for wishing he would come, for looking for him, for standing firm in your testimony that he's coming again. There is a crown coming to you as a believer for being faithful in your righteousness, in your testimony. Next crown is the crown of glory, and that is a, a crown that is given to you for being faithful, intending to those that the Lord has given to you, entrusted to you. You can find this verse in 1 Peter uh, 5, 1 through 4. First Peter 5, 1 through 4 says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is, um, that is among you, exercising oversight, not, among, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. For not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you are elder who are younger, be subject to elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility towards one another. Another God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So you can see in those verses, there's a crown coming for being a faithful shepherd to those who God has entrusted to you. So if God has given you somebody who is just newer in the faith, you you are going to get a crown for the way that you've shepherded them along. I know that the verse here says elders, but it, it goes for all of us who are a little bit more mature in the faith than maybe somebody coming up under us. If we're faithful in the way we've shepherded them along, then we will get a crown of glory given to us in heaven. Fifth and last crown is called the crown of life. And this one is found in James 1 through 12. And this one is for staying faithful through temptation. So we all know that temptation will still come to us on this earth, um, even though we are believers. But if we can stay faithful in the way that we fight off, resist the temptation, we will get this crown. And I'm having a hard time getting to it. <coughs> Let's see. This is James 1, 12. All right. James 1, 12 says... Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So, crown of life coming to those who are faithful through the temptations that come on this life. So, every time you've fought off a temptation, you've said no to something that has tripped you up before, God is watching that. A mighty God is seeing that and He's, he's remembering, and at the beam of seat of judgment, he's going to hand you a crown for staying faithful in that. So it's an amazing thing to know that when Jesus comes, he's going to have rewards waiting for us in heaven. They didn't get us to heaven, but he wants to bless us even more than giving us salvation when we see him in person. This Bema seat is going to happen immediately after the rapture of his church. And so if you're wondering about the timeline of that, that is when it happens. I'm just going to read for you a verse in Revelation 22, uh, a couple of verses, 12 through 15. Uh, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense, that's reward, with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and they might enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So here Jesus is saying he's coming for those who believe in him with a reward. For those who do not believe, everybody outside the faith, they will not be in heaven and they will be left outside as you see there. So that is the Bema Seat. And that is what Jesus has in store for us, for those who believe in heaven. It's a judgment, but it's a judgment of our work on earth for him. And not that we want it even, but he gives us even more blessings in heaven for what we've done for him. Um, the verses you can look at for the Bema seat, Romans 14.10 talks about the judgment seat as well if you want to turn there you can take a look Romans 14 10 through 12 says I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean for if your brother is grieved oops am I reading the wrong verses so sorry, I am. 14, 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or, or, or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That's the Bema seat. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. And then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And so as believers... We will not sit at the judgment seat of God and, and give an account of our sin. As I said from the beginning, our sin is washed away. We will never have to answer for any of it if we have put our, our, our trust in Christ Jesus. But we will sit at the Bema seat of Christ and we will be held in judgment accountable for what we did with what God gave us on earth and so we as believers know that we've been given great blessings on earth we've given tons of opportunity to share the gospel and God is watching our mighty God and he sees what we've been doing and he rewards that stuff which has been done for the kingdom of God all the rest of it all the stuff we do on earth that is just for us that's all burned up it's it's not rewarded at all it doesn't mean anything to god so you can be doing great amazing things and donating all kinds of time and energy and if it's not for the kingdom of god if it's not um, glorifying jesus then to god it doesn't it doesn't mean anything really so it's uh it's a it's something to think about uh, your motivation in what you do as a believer to make sure that you're motivated by love of Christ and to glorify his name and to share of his of his fame not your own so that when God uh, and you meet at the Bema seat of Christ he will put a crown on your head and he will say, say good well done good and faithful servant and just so you know, um, the Bible is clear in the book of Revelation that we who believe in Christ are going to throw those crowns back on to his feet, not feeling worthy for any of it, not taking credit, credit for any of us, because those of us who are in Christ know that what we've done on earth is nothing, nothing for us and nothing compared to what's been done for us. And so the mighty God wants to bless us in heaven for what we've done for him at the end of it we will throw those crowns right back at Jesus and say thank you but all the glory is for you Jesus all right so that's our Bible study for today mighty God and I look forward to hearing from you on the website if you want to subscribe at injesusname.net and you'll get the rest of the names of God Bible study sent right to you all right thanks so much have a blessed day bye now